The Merchant of Death is Dead. This headline from a French newspaper in 1888 announced to the world the death of Alfred Nobel. The article went on to detail Alfred's life and declared that he had amassed his wealth, quote, by finding ways to kill people faster than ever before. You see, some 20 years earlier, Alfred's younger brother, Emil, had been killed in a nitroglycerin plant accident. As a result, Alfred devoted his life to create a safer, more stable form of this highly unstable liquid. And he was ultimately successful, naming his invention dynamite from the Greek word dynamos, meaning power. Dynamite was used to build tunnels and mine natural resources, but it was also used to create more powerful bombs, landmines, and weaponry. Now, there was just one problem with this article. It wasn't actually Alfred who had died, but his older brother, Ludwig. As a result, Alfred became one of the few people in human history to have the privilege or curse of reading their own obituary and seeing the world's reaction to his death. This reaction led Alfred to a crisis of conscience. How would he be remembered for this lasting power he brought into the world? Well, in an effort to reshape that legacy, upon his actual death, Alfred left the bulk of his net worth through his estate plan to create and endow the Nobel Prizes. So with Alfred as a backdrop, I'd like to start by asking you two questions. First, what is your net worth? And second, what do you plan on leaving as an inheritance? Now, if you're like most people, you think of these terms in a financial context. As an estate planning attorney, I can guarantee you that's exactly how I was trained to think of these terms. In fact, when I started practicing, I did so based on two fundamental assumptions. The first is that a person's net worth can be summarized on a balance sheet. And the second is that if transferring some wealth is good, then transferring more must be better. Now, it wasn't too long after I started practicing that I ran into experiences that ran counter to these basic assumptions. Notwithstanding some of the finest 84-page trusts, written in third person with more whereases than you could possibly imagine. <laughs> I felt like the documents I prepared lacked something. There was a good skeletal system, but there was no heart. There was no soul. Imagine me as an attorney having to deal with something that had no heart or soul. <laughs> Second, I found that clients became increasingly concerned about the potential negative effects of wealth transfer. They weren't acting like it was inherently good. They were acting like, well, like it was dynamite. And it wasn't too long before I saw why. I saw families destroyed, addictions fed, heirs stripped of purpose. And it culminated the day when I sat in a courtroom watching teams of lawyers on opposite sides fighting over a parent's estate with siblings who were unable to even look at each other. And I thought, this is wealth? This is inheritance? My colleague Andrew Howell and I, or my colleague Andrew Howell had many of the same experiences, and so it led the two of us on a journey of sorts to try to figure out what wealth really is and what inheritance ought to be. And we came to find that our fundamental assumptions were, well, fundamentally wrong. The reality is that a person's net worth cannot simply be found on a balance sheet. And simply because transferring more wealth is good, it does not, or some wealth is good, it does not mean that transferring more is better. So let's look at each of these assumptions. The reality is that for most of human existence, wealth had a much more holistic definition. Wealth was seen in the sum of our experiences, our skills and abilities, our knowledge, our collective narrative wisdom. The focus on capturing and passing this human capital can be seen going back more than 5,000 years. The Talmud taught that the primary responsibility one generation has to the other is to teach them God's word, to give them a skill or ability, and even to teach them how to swim. In other words, it taught that the primary responsibility we have is to teach the next generation who they are and how to survive and thrive in this world. So how do we do this? Let me give you two ideas. First, before you make a list of your assets, 
Make a list of your core values. What drives you? What motivates you? Alfred Nobel's core values included achievement, excellence, and peace. And his establishment of the Nobel Prizes created a stage for the likes of Martin Luther King, Albert Einstein, Marie Curie, and most recently, Malala Yousafzai. Second, before you write your estate plan, write your life story. Detail your successes. Capture your failures. Share all those things you wish you had known and pass those on like you would your most treasured, tangible possession. Now, the second assumption is that if transferring some wealth is good, then more must be better. This is quintessential Western culture. What's better than a dollar? Two dollars. What's better than two dollars? Five dollars. The reality is, though, as you pass along the wealth continuum, you begin to see diminishing and even negative return on that wealth transfer. This also is not such a new concept. More than 3,000 years ago, Solomon said, Give me neither riches nor poverty, but only my daily bread. You see, he saw having too much as being every bit as bad as having nothing at all. When we have nothing, we can't even get in the game. When we have too much, we don't even need to play. So what does it look like when we focus primarily on the transfer of financial capital with very little human capital? Cornelius Vanderbilt was the wealthiest man in America when he died in 1877. To give you an idea of the amount of his wealth, this stick of dynamite represents the average American inheritance today. Not an insignificant sum. So how much did he leave? Not this amount, but this amount. More than $185 billion in today's dollars. And yet, within just 30 years, not one of his family members was among the wealthiest in America. And within 100 years, at a family reunion attended to by more than 100 descendants, there was not one millionaire in the group. You see, they were left so much they could not only do anything, but they could do nothing. And they did a lot of nothing. They were reality TV before it was cool. Keeping up with the Vanderbilts. <laughs> One heir summarized their experience like this. Inherited wealth was a real handicap to happiness. So what does it look like when we focus primarily on the transfer of human capital with very limited financial resources? Two quick stories. Ruth and Elias were hardworking parents of five children. Their fourth son, uh, or their fourth child, a son, was quite artistic. So in addition to teaching their son about construction and facades, they enrolled their son in art classes at the Chicago Art Institute. Through the encouragement and small loan from his older brother, Roy, their son was able to fulfill his dream of starting his own business. Their son's name was Walt Disney. Paul and Clara were blue-collar workers living in San Francisco. Paul taught his adopted son not just about mechanics and electronics, but about the importance of aesthetics in design, even down to the parts that couldn't be seen. When their son wanted to start his business, they loaned out several rooms in their house to create an assembly plant. Their son's name was Steve Jobs. Two very different people, but each had something in common. They were given rich amounts of human capital and strategic amounts of financial resources, and they were able to multiply that many-fold. So why is all this important? Do you remember Cornelius' $185 billion? Well, the Center for Wealth and Philanthropy at Boston College projects that over the course of the next 30 years, the baby boomer generation will ultimately transfer more than 216 times that amount or more than $40 trillion. This will become the largest financial wealth transfer in the history of the world. So what if we upcycled wealth transfer? What if instead of simply transferring visionless dynamite, we first captured our human capital in all its forms, and we strategically coupled it with our financial resources? What kind of heirs could we produce for successive generations? If we did that, how much of that otherwise wasted part of the inverted U-curve could we redeploy into scientific advancement, education, caring for the poor? What terrible things in the world could we work to eradicate? What beautiful things in the world could we work to multiply? I'd like to end by asking you two questions. First, what is your net worth? And second, 
What do you plan on leaving as an inheritance? Now, I can actually answer the first question for you. You may be thinking, I'm no Walt Disney. I'm no Steve Jobs. But that doesn't mean you aren't Roy Disney or Paul Jobs. The reality is we each have rich amounts of human capital just waiting to be deployed. And not just in children and grandchildren, but in nieces and nephews and friends and neighbors. The reality is our collective human capital is our greatest renewable resource. Now, as far as the second question, obviously I can't answer that one for you, but I will say this. If we capture wealth in all its forms and we strategically use that with the financial resources we have, we have the potential to make the next 30 years the greatest wealth transfer in the history of the world. Thank you.